truly is a pleasure. Uh, this is based on a uh, white paper that uh, we have uh, produced at um, Begin um, Blockchain Governance Initiative Network, uh, a think tank and a sort of multi-stakeholder organization that I'm a member of, um, the co-chair of the Decentralized Treasury Working uh, Group. Um, I'm also uh, a professor of finance at University of Wyoming and I hold the John A. Guthrie Chair in Banking. Uh, we started this um, about a year ago uh, when Terra Luna, well, before Terra Luna happened, uh, we had this as uh, in our radar to sort of generate uh, uh, a broad perspective, I guess, uh, overview type of paper. And then by the time, you know, we got everything together, Terra Luna happens. And of course, now, you know, everybody wants to know about this stuff. And uh, 2022 happened to be probably the most uh, exciting, and that's the most polite way of putting it, year for stable points. Uh, so let me, uh, so, so this is um, in great part ba based on that white paper, but also have other, uh, another follow-up work that I'm working on it. Uh, uh, individually, so so some of this stuff is not in the paper. It's because of all the other stuff that I'm doing. Um, so to give you a sort of flashback, uh, you know, in January 2017, um, where basically we could say stable coins started, so to speak. Uh, the market cap for these things were, um, you know, next. No, oh, didn't want to do that. Uh, were uh, quite a small, uh, 20 million. I mean, that's nothing to speak of. Uh, in about five years, uh, they stood at around 180 billion, uh, which is you know astronomical growth. Uh, majority of that uh, was due to growth in Tether, but other ones sort of show up uh, along the line. Uh, at a time before the Terra Luna uh, sort of a collapse, uh, Tether was the largest at 83 billion. Uh, Terra was the third largest at about 18 billion, and. Uh, so th these are data for beginning of April. And by the time we actually had our meeting last summer uh, uh, in you know middle of July, uh, Tether was basically down to zero. Uh, I'm sorry, Terra was down to zero. Tether actually lost quite a bit of market cap, uh, you know, about $20 billion. That's almost a quarter of its uh, market cap. And the entire market basically not only lost the value that Terra represented, but there were also other losses that happened. Now, some of the loss that Tether, for instance, had is, uh, uh, you know, went to other stable coins, but not entirely. So there was some leakage from the system. If you will. So what was the Terra Luna effect? Well, uh, in May 5th, uh, it's kind of like a recap of what I just said, but, you know, going through the major ones that stood the test of time since. Uh, so the ma major top three ones that have sort of been top three for some time now is Tether USDC and Binance uh, USD for, uh, for some time. Uh, you know, before uh, the, the Terra Luna collapse, uh, you know, in the order, it was 83, uh, 48 billion and 18 billion. So Binance and Terra were very much close to each other. Terra was just a little bit, you know, above it. Uh, by, you know, late uh, summer or mid summer, um, obviously there was no Terra. Uh, Terra was basically down to 66 uh, billion. That's almost uh, 16, you know, in excess of $16 billion loss of market cap. And quite a bit of that was observed by uh, USDC, about half of it, uh, and uh, you know a little bit uh, uh, other uh, uh, stable coins, but not much. So you know, like I said, not only the loss of Terra was a leakage out of system, but also some of the losses, quite a bit of the losses that Tether had, was also a leakage of system. So that tells you that there is uh, well, Terra's loss was total loss. I mean, it just went to the thin air. Uh, but there were uh, clearly uh, quite a bit of money that uh, went out of the system and turned into whatever the fiat or backing was. So at a time, you know, this is the kind of big picture of what the ranking is stood after uh, Terra's collapse. And for most part, the top uh, four or five names you see, they kind of like to stick around. So I'll, I'll show you this picture for you know what it looks like today. You can see that there's quite a bit of overlap with these names and, and the rankings are almost the, uh, the same as well. The market cap number sort of changes, but the rankings are, are very sticky and, and uh, where they are in, in the grand scheme of things also seem to be uh, quite a state. So since Terra, obviously quite a lot has happened. The first major event, which was actually after our meeting, uh, was the announcement by uh, Binance uh, for the auto conversion of pretty much every other major 
uh, stable coin to their stable coin. And so this is a, just a screenshot of their announcement. And as you can see, you know, it tells you that uh, all the major, major ones are gonna be uh, uh, auto-converted within a few days of that announcement. It tells you what the ratios are for most part is one-to-one, -one, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, when you think about it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, imagine you go to a bank and you put your US dollar and then uh, somebody calls and says, well, yeah, you, you deposit a US dollar, but from this point on, this is not US dollar. This is, I don't know, you know, my XYZ uh, coin. So uh, just, just imagine what that makes you feel like. So that, that's, that's exactly what happened. So clearly it should have some impact, right? Uh, so here again- um, hey, Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you know if, if what like was the process that Binance did, like they, if you had like, for example, USDC and they convert it to their coin, um, what they did with the USDC, they withdraw it to $1 and then uh, put it in their bank account or they- No, no, they, 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 they literally burned that and minted an equivalent. I see. So okay. here, what I said, you know, you put a dollar in, 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 the, in the bank account and someone says, well, this no longer dollar is my uh, currency. That, that's exactly what happened. It just okay. changed the nature of the currency. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, a little bit before this conversion, this is how it is stood. Now, I, I give you the picture. So there has been some stuff that has been, or at least expectations have been readjusting since um, uh, sort of a midsummer. So this announcement was inside of that uh, trend. But as you can see, again, you know, Tether was the highest, USDC was the second, you know, Binance itself uh, was the third. And, uh, you know, a little bit after that announcement, and I'm giving it about a month because uh, I, I wanna also link this to what happened uh, with FTX. So kind of like setting the game up for that. Uh, but as you can see, you know, Tether actually gained a little bit, not, not much, but, you know, gained a little bit. Uh, uh, USDC lost uh, quite a lot. Uh, and, you know, Binance itself, um, I think I made a mistake, it gained just a little bit. I mean, hair, not, not much. Uh, so there was no significant benefit uh, from Binance doing this. If you look at you know their own stable coin, but what it did was certainly hurt the major competitors, uh, and uh, you know the second major for sure, uh, the first one eh, not not much. Uh, now this uh, you know later on I come back to it. I think this was the first time that uh, a uh, a risk that typically in a currency exchange, especially when economies wants to peg their currencies against each other, you don't necessarily see it. Uh, but because of the nature of this ecosystem, you see it, and that's uh, heavy reliance on basically the pipeline, so to speak. Exchanges allow for, for the flow, and so they do play a significant role. They can become a bottleneck, and as you can see, this is what I would dub it as a bottleneck, uh, bottleneck risk. Uh, so if you have a tremendous exposure to one of these bottlenecks, if they try to you know, manipulate things and mess with the bottleneck, you are exposed to that risk. And this happens to USDC again, because they have another uh, risk that shows up in F, uh, you know, lately and very much resemble this, that you're at the mercy of people who actually manage the entire pipelines. So what happened next, you know, not even a month uh, later was the famous or the infamous um, sort of a, a tweet by CZ. Uh, that basically said, you know, we, uh, we're, we're liquidating everything we've got in, uh, in FTX. And uh, I'm not uh, the only one now, you know, it's, it's public knowledge that everyone basically blamed uh, him for the failure of FTX. Now, that's not entirely true. You know, failure of FTX has a lot to do with other stuff. Uh, but this certainly has a started a, a run on FTX and led to the failure. So again, what was the effect, you know, right before that announcement, maybe a couple of days before that announcement, as you can see, this is the ranking of the top three. Uh, and after about a week after that announcement, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of loss for Tether, uh, you know, not huge, but still significant. Uh, majority of that actually went to USDC, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in part because FDX, uh, Tether played a, a proportionally more, a larger role within the FTX ecosystem as opposed to USDC within that ecosystem. And, uh, and as you can see, it's not surprising that there is that 
flow from riskier and riskier stable coins to le less risky or more um, safer ones uh, as they were perceived. And of course, now we come to you know the last uh, month or half or two months, and that's the Silvergate and uh, Silicon Valley Bank you know saga. Uh, on March eighth, uh, where you know early on in the day, Silvergate actually uh, basically announced that they're shutting down operation, and they were major bank for crypto industry. Uh, but it followed by SBB announcing uh, a significant equity issuance or plan for a significant equity issuance, uh, which, you know, is never a good sign when a bank wants to raise, you know, a lot of money because then, you know, they're hugely undercapitalized. Uh, not a day later, you know, stock uh, opened with 30% loss. By the end of the day, it was 60% down. So obviously, you know, things are unraveling. Uh, especially when uh, people, you know, found out that major uh, VC customers that they have clients that they have are withdrawing a tremendous amount of deposits out. And by the end of uh, the day, now we know that close to about $42 billion of deposits were being withdrawn. So now a, a full on run has started uh, on the bank, one of you know, the largest in history. Uh, now a day later, FDIC has to step in, basically take over the bank and start the process of unwinding uh, the bank. So, you know, within the course of uh, four days, maybe not even that, uh, one of the major banks in the U.S. and the top 10 banks in the U.S. Uh, basically ceased to exist. So what was the result of this saga? Well, again, in March 6th, uh, this is the ranking of the top three, as you can see. Uh, and this is March 10th. So, you know, it straddles that, uh, that announcement, basically. Uh, what you basically see is that, uh, you know, Tether gained just a little bit, I mean, not, not much. Uh, but here we have, uh, you know, USDC essentially lost, uh, you know, close to about uh, 20, maybe 25% uh, of, of their market cap. And uh, in no small part, because they used uh, SVB as the exclusive bank to take care of their AML KYC. So um, I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, pictures and then come back to, you know, what, what this means as far as risk that a stable coin faces. And of course, there are dichotomies of what the stable coins actually are. Uh, but uh, this is Tether. And as you can see, you know, the, uh, the, 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 this, this blip that you see here, the down and then coming back up, uh, the coming down is uh, essentially the effect of Terra. Uh, you know, people have started questioning whether uh, what Tether reports as the backing uh, is kosher, so to speak, or not, uh, whether there is any question about uh, its validity, uh, access, liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because one of the problems with Terra was, and then I'll get to that, that in, a, in a bit, uh, it was a full-on liquidity crisis that, you know, feed on itself and became a full-on run. Um, but as you can see, after that, it kind of stabilized and none of the other crises really hit it that much. And if anything, in fact, when it came to uh, the, the, the link to the banking system, because their business model is not exactly like USDC, they gain quite a bit of the market share while everybody else is losing. And when, when I mean everybody else, I mean everybody else. Uh, so uh, the first one is USDC and the Binance. Both of these are basically fiat backs. Uh, and uh, again, you can see that you know both the second and, and uh, the third one have lost quite a lot of their market share uh, throughout you know last year in episodes, but they have. You know the first one, you know the uh, USDC gained a little bit from the Terra effect, but ever since you know it's been just coming down. And of course, this SVB effect has been quite sharp and, and painful. Uh, but the news for, uh, you know, Binance hasn't been, you know, great either. I, I think uh, they might have fend off, a, they might have a stop run on their own ecosystem uh, as, as you compare it to FDX. But as far as their own stable coin goes, as you can see, I mean, the, the, you know, the picture is a thousand words. Um, I don't think anyone can argue that uh, the, the policy over the last year has not been very successful uh, with respect to their stable coin. Now, we, we have ahead. a question in the chat. Okay. About um, the motivation for using stablecoin. All um, right. So I'll, I'll get to that in, in a minute. If you just bear with me, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so I'm putting a die here because I'm, I'm going to get to these in, in a minute. 
Uh, these are not exactly like the first three. So die, frax, and few others, they're algorithmic. So they're not backed necessarily by a fiat. Some of them are backed by cryptos or a combination thereof, but they really rely on market force to bring a stability. All right, so, so that's where I'm gonna build um, wire stable points. All right, well, um, in theory, these things are actually not that new. Uh, <laughs> Um, all of you are probably way too uh, young to remember, but uh, hopefully you've read it in your banking classes. Uh, back in 70s, or about 60s and 70s, the United States had a regulation queue that basically maxed the rate you paid on the deposit, and it was that 6.75. Uh, and, and again, if you uh, recall a little bit of history during the late 60s and 70s, inflation run wild. Uh, at its highest, you know, it was hovering around, you know, 18, 19%. Uh, so it went from, you know, below 5% all the way to, you know, 20 in, in a span of less than a decade, basically. Uh, and you can imagine that at some point in time, very early on, actually, in, in 70s, it became very clear that if you took your money out of the bank account and parked it somewhere else, just, just a T-bill would have done it. Uh, you could have made two, three, you know, four times of interest uh, by doing that. And so there was an exodus of deposits, especially large deposits from the U.S. banking system to go elsewhere. Uh, quite a bit went to, uh, you know, T-bills, uh, but, you know, the, the, the much larger ones, uh, they used the banking system as a, as a mechanism to basically flow the money around. And so, uh, you know, when, when you're trying to earn just a little bit from the amounts that is sitting there, even for a day, uh, you can't just park it in T-bill because you, know, you still have to wait till it matures, et cetera. You need something that is a whole lot more liquid even than that. So what's the solution? Well, you know, two things emerge. One, quite a bit of those deposits that belong to major money market banks, they all flew to London, which didn't have a regulation queue. And they, in London, they started trading these deposits with each other and that created euro dollar market, which then you know, created LIBOR, et cetera, et cetera. And it became an ungodly huge market that underpinned every floating rate instrument, et cetera. The other one was that, and, and it started actually on in the investment industry and then you know, proliferated elsewhere, was that you really didn't want to move the money elsewhere in the world and do this. You still wanted to stay within the US, but just you don't want to be stuck with a you know, lousy uh, deposit account. And you didn't want to be all locked up into a T-bill and wait for its maturity. So they created what now we call money market funds. Uh, the money market funds were invented to be able to have something that is quasi deposit uh, and it's very liquid, much like a deposit account, much like a checking account, but it operates under a different rule and hence it can give you a competitive rate. And of course, you know, if you ever opened any uh, you know, brokerage account, you know that one of the first things that they ask you is, well, you know, if you're not using your money, can we put this money in our you know, money market fund, blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly what it is. So every time you buy and sell a stock or any security, it doesn't turn into cash. It actually goes into their money market fund. And then that money market fund has a portfolio that, um, uh, that manages. Now, why the longest story? Because that scheme basically tells you that there are a lot of instances in life that you need liquidity for an entire financial ecosystem that can exist separate from the banking, and it needs to operate, right? So it has different speed, different liquidity needs, et cetera, et cetera. So now it comes to our world. You know, this is the age of digital commerce. Uh, you know, you go, you click, click on your app, you know, Amazon, whatever have you. The speeds at which you, we buy and sell stuff and exchange goods and services is just to the roof. However, we still deal with a financial system that is stodgy and very slow. If you send money today, it's going to take a week before you can actually see any evidence that money has been transferred. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot of sort of a slowness in, in a financial system that doesn't match the speed of a digital commerce. So if I want to the, the speed of finance to get close to uh, the commerce, what do I do? Well, we could create a digital money and a stable coins are basically that they are a digital money. They've got the features of having low volatility. You know, they, they, they do have volatility I mean, for, for, for long while we thought we, they don't, but they, they actually do. But you know, it's very low. Uh, they're widely accepted, you know, as, as you saw, I mean, you know, Tether has proven that, you know, it's accepted everywhere. Uh, they have quite a bit of interoperability, adaptability, adoptability, et cetera, et cetera. It's not perfect. None of them are perfect, uh, but they do have these features to some extent. Tether probably is one of the better ones. USDC is probably one of the better ones. 
but you know they, they all try strive to to get to, to to these three sort of the features and while they're not perfect like a cash so you know something that you want from a currency is especially a base currency you want it to have an nqa feature no question asked about its provenance when you get a dollar bill it's a dollar bill when you walk into any bank you know they accept it from you now i understand if if, if it's a big number like a hundred dollar bill they're going to look at it they want to make sure it's not fake etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know in lower denomination even if it's fake they're just not going to bother you right they, they take care of it somewhere else so it, it's got to be something that is near as good as, you know, cash money, uh, like money market funds, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why we want to stay with points, something that resembles like a digital cash. So, you know, this is a picture of, you know, Bitcoin versus Tether. As you can see, you know, I, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to say that which one is less volatile, Tether is less volatile. So these things are behaving the way you expect them to behave. They're not perfect, no doubt about that. But they are, you know, they're, they're manifesting features that you want from something that is a digital cash. All right, so did I answer the question or? or... Yeah, so if there, if there is an additional question, you can write in the chat. All right, um, so um, things to consider with the stable coins. Um, the peg, uh, you know, how does it work against what, et cetera. Uh, whether itself is algorithmic or not, that makes a huge difference between what the stable coin is and how it operates and what uh, ecosystem belongs to, et cetera. And very closely related to that is collateralization. Uh, not necessarily in a sense, what the collateral is, but also what the collateralization rules are. So uh, let me start with a brief description. You know, uh, as I said, you know, they, they, the stable coins in general, they try to mimic the value of some underlying asset. If they're fiat back, they're trying to basically stay one-to-one -to, -one to the fiat. So Tether, you know, tries to stay with, uh, with US dollar. Tether gold tries to stay with the value of the gold. Uh, USDC, again, with US dollar. The original ones, you know, they tried. It's just that uh, in order to, to do it, they actually used a crypto in the middle. And that's one of the problems that uh, Terra had as well, that they introduced their own uh, Luna, their own crypto into the equation, trying to maintain a peg against a outside currency. And that, that's, that's where, you know, things can get... Um, Sort of broken down really fast. Uh, the advantage, for instance, for Tether and USDC is when you give them the dollar, these are going to be invested and deposited in very liquid assets. Now, what the liquid asset means, you know, for Tether and USDC is different. Tether basically uses this to buy a very large, diverse set of liquid assets, commercial paper, corporate bonds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas USDC, the USDC's menu is a whole lot narrower. Um, and, and I'll get to that in, in a minute. So how do they then you know, maintain this peg? Well, uh, it really depends who we're talking about. If you're talking about uh, the, uh, the fiat backed ones, it's, it's really simple. The moment you give me your dollar, let, let's, let's think about this in a very simplistic way. You, the, the moment you give me your, uh, your dollar, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna segregate that dollar and put it in a bank account. So your money is in a bank account. And against that, I'm gonna mint the coin. Well. If we agree that it's one to one, if you give me a thousand bucks, I'm going to give you a thousand coins. For all times, the value should remain uh, one to one. If, if the dollar still is a bank account, whenever you come back and you give me the coins, I can give you the dollar. So this creates a fundamental link that cannot be broken, right? So then you say, well, what, what, is there volatility in the peg? Absolutely. Why? Well, <laughs> uh, the thing that is in bank accounts, you have to ask whether that bank is going to be around or not. For the longest time, we assume everything is fine till. Silicon Valley happened, and then we realize, ah, wait a minute. Um, the, the fact that the, the coin that I gave you, that coin itself should exist for all times. But then when Binance decided to basically swap them with their own, that coin all of a sudden disappeared. So now you have to ask, wait a minute, this account was backing of those coins, but those coins don't exist anymore. So now what's going to happen? So there are questions, there are uncertainties, and this is not a perfect game, right? 
So, and those show up in how people feel about whether that pig is perfect or not. But again, in theory, if you give me a dollar amount and I write against it, my coin and that dollar amount is fixed and safe and sound, there is no reason to think that, you know, there should be any change from whatever ratio we agreed on. It could be one to one, it could be one to 10, it doesn't really matter. But the trans, uh, translation rate should stay same for all time. Now, you know, that's basically what Tether and USDC do. The only difference is but when I say they put it in a bank account, that's not entirely true. They, how they manage that, it's a little bit different. So this is from uh, Circle's own, you know, white paper, as you can see. Uh, one of the things that they tell you is that um, in order for the entire game, so to speak, to work, uh, you really, especially for, for a fiat bag, you really can't have 100% decentralization. Uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons for it. The, perhaps the most important reason is uh, if you want not to be in at odds with uh, bank regulators, uh, then this needs to be anti uh, compliance with anti-money laundering and know your customer uh, rules. And that's universal, you know, this is a universal rule. So either you build that capacity inside yourself, which is expensive, compliance is not an easy thing, or you basically lease it, right? I mean, if, if I basically tell a bank, all right, well, I'm bringing billions of dollars of deposits, what I want you to do is to basically rubber stamp and make sure that they're kosher and tell me that they are, so I don't have to fight with the regulator. So I'm basically outsourcing that service to the bank. Obviously, the bank wants something for it, right? I mean, they're not gonna give me very competitive deposit rates. That's, that's how they recoup that cost. But in return, I don't have to build that capacity myself. Someone else is doing it for me. And then I'll take that and issue the coin. So this gives me a lot of control, right? I mean, this is not decentralized. That aspect is quite centralized because I want to save costs. Uh, so, you know, that, and, and of course, you know, that when, when you read their, their white paper, that's the, 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 their philosophy that, you know, we, we, we want to be compliant. We, we don't want to be, you know, in fight with regulators. And in order to make sure that that's true, we really can't make this decentralized. I mean, at least it, it, for sure, it can't be fully uh, decentralized, but uh, most definitely it, it looks like a centralized uh, system. Uh, the other thing it has to do with price stability, uh, especially, and this is universal for basically all the stable coins, whether they are uh, fiat back or you know, algo, uh, you need to be in control of flows in order to make sure that there is a stability. So for instance, in currencies, uh, you know, countries that are worried about uh, run on their currency and, and pegs get, get broken or whatnot, eventually they do instill some sort of a capital flow uh, constraint. Malaysia has done it, Indonesia has done it, et cetera. And for a long time, you know, people thought this is anti, you know, market, blah, blah, blah. And what we found that in the 90s and, and actually in 2000 is that actually it helps that stability actually makes the economy work better. So the crisis passes by and then you can go back to normal. So, uh, you know, those lessons true everywhere. If you wanna maintain a stability in a system, sometimes you need to be able to put constraints for the capital flow. A decentralized system would never allow you to do that. So it has to have some sort of a centralization feature to it in order for you to be able to maintain the stability. Right? Um, now, there are other concerns as well. For instance, um, you know, when you get, so Paxos, for instance, has a lot of uh, commodity based stuff uh, like uh, gold, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, the, the, this is true for all of them, whether the backing is fiat or other uh, commodities. Uh, when you uh, make the, the, the backing colorful, there are challenges in that. So for instance, one of the things we learned in 2008 was one of the oldest money market fund failed because they had one position, one, one position that for some odd reason, that position, uh, they, they weren't able to liquidate. So when you think about it, it's something like this. Imagine that you, I have thousand bucks and these thousand bucks are spread over thousand one dollar position. So at any point in time, you know that this, you know, I gave you a, a certificate that says for every one of these certificates, you can get a dollar back, but this dollar is backed by portfolio, right? So uh, things are good until one day you find out that I had one of these things that I needed to sell and I couldn't sell. And in order to move it, I had to give a discount. So for instance, it should be that it's $1, right? 
a liquid acid, I should be able to set a product. But on that specific day, for some fluke of nature, when I tried to sell it, it only sold for 80 cents. Well, that's 20 cents discount that I had to observe for one position. Sure, it's one out of a thousand, but this is still a discount from a dollar. So when you come in, you're not sure if I can actually deliver that dollar, right? I have a lot of other to sell and give you the dollar, but you're not sure if those are liquid. That one instant, that one fund, one position froze the entire money market fund because the trust went away, right? People sort of thought, wait a minute, we thought everything is liquid, but now you're telling us not, and in the, in the oldest one, so how bad is everywhere else? So sometimes you need the control to basically stop runs like this to get really bad, right? So the solution for us in 2008 was the Fed had to step in and say, all right, fine, we buy everything. I mean, these are all as good as cash. We're just going to take care of this illiquidity problem. All right, so what are the major, uh, uh, you know, major ones uh, that we, we've had for some time? Terra, USDC, Binance, Pax Dollar, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, one of the things about them is there is always has been a question about what the collateral they say they have, you know, all those dollars in bank account. Exactly where is it? How is it doing? So they've increasingly over time, they, they increase their frequency of reporting. Uh, some of them actually now go as far as give you the detail of what they hold. So if they tell you, you know, we own T-bills, they give you QCIP by QCIP, you know, what the T-bills are, which actually all the money market funds do that all the time. Uh, they do, you know, auditing, but, you know, these are um, some Cayman Island, uh, you know, auditors. So they're not really the big four. So there's always, eh, is it really audited? Is it not? Uh, they're not all um, sort of a under uh, auspicious of regulators. Uh, Binance and, uh, you know, some of the other ones are um, somehow, you know, under regulation in New York, but not elsewhere. Uh, some of it is, uh, is not their own fault, right? I mean, you know, the, at least in the U.S., we've been very hostile against crypto. So, you know, even if they want to, they, they really can't. Uh, but, you know, they've done their best. Uh, so this is the example of, you know, why their the peg could be shaky. And I, and I, I talked about this. Already. You have multiple positions. One starts to sell for discount. All of a sudden, you lose trust, and nothing can be trusted anymore. So that pay, you know, all of a sudden collapses. So uh, have we seen an example of this? You bet. Uh, we um, uh, when Terra happened, this happened to Terra because you know the whole point of uh, Terra was Terra was basically saying, well, we're going to back everything. We're all cryptocurrency. Our crypto and our stable corner within a closed uh, ecosystem, and no one can, you know, put a run on us. Problem was that they actually had a lending borrowing arm that dealt with the outside ecosystems, and that's where the leakage came from. That's where you know the break in the system came. So everybody start questioning. Uh, they report, but is it true? Can they really liquid? So as you can see, in one day alone, the peg against dollar dropped by three percent. Just to sort of tell you how bad this is, in the extreme case scenario on major currencies, if you have a 1% move, you had a nightmare day. So as you can see, this is three times nightmare days in currencies. So this is bad. I mean, as bad as it can get. And, and of course, you know, subsequent to that, you know, they started losing market cap. And so the money just started going out of there. Uh, the winner in that instance clearly was, uh, you know, USDC. And as you can see, you know, that one day, uh, not exactly same uh, size, but you know, they had a huge uh, upside sort of volatility and they started to gain some of that uh, market uh, cap loss. Uh, so what are the lessons? For the fiat banks, uh, the lessons are parallel to money market. I mean, in fact, we don't need to scratch our head and try to recreate anything. We've learned over almost 50 years of dealing with money markets, what needs to happen for someone who tries to create a private cash, which these are basically private digital cash. First thing, you have to define what your investment strategy is. You can't deviate. If you say that, you know, I do, so for instance, USDC is uh, very clear that, you know, we maintain 80% cash, 20% in uh, US government IOUs, liquid ones. Uh, you gotta go even more than that. You gotta say, you know, for instance, 80% is gonna be cash, 10% in T-bills, 2% uh, is this, the other. So, you know, you set a very clear investment strategy and then you do full disclosure. So you report line by line, what T-bills you own, what notes you own, et cetera, et cetera. So I can, you know, verify if they are or not. 
And then you audit with auditors who are having, you know, having done this and they know how this works. So when they rubber stamp it, everyone knows you have this strategy, you reported it, everything you reported is okay. So I can trust that. If you say that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be able to sell things, you know, at par and get your money back. That's not, you know, a, a fake claim. You can actually do that. And the last bit, which is not necessarily something that the stable coins have under control. And as you can see, I mean, if, if you, uh, you know, listen to the news, they really are trying to make this happen is that there's got to be some regulation and they have to adhere to that regulation. So there is that trust in the market. Now, this is a part that, like I said, they've, they've tried, they tried to be hostile about it, you know, a few years ago, then they became friendly. Uh, the regulators were hostile. So it's a back and forth game that we still don't have a solution for it. But the menu of things that needs to happen for a, a fiat back to be successful, it's actually set by 50 years of experimentation in other you know, places. Now, things that are still important uh, and could cause uh, deviation, could cause volatility, could cause you know, loss of trust are counterparty risk and operation risk. You know, I said that you know, they try to be interoperable. Uh, even if you write that in your code that could move from one to another to another, I mean, from chain to chain to chain to chain can, can basically move without any difficulty, you're still at the mercy of the bottlenecks. So if Binance comes in and says, well, forget it, we're going to you know, auto-convert, uh, there's nothing you can do. Unless you have basically built a, a sort of a smart contract feature to it, that the moment that announcement comes, it kind of like withdraws everything from that system. But you know, you're still at their mercy, right? I mean, they made an announcement that you have three days to basically do it. But if, if I knew that you had a smart contract, I might give you like two seconds. I mean, I'm, I'm still you're still at my mercy because I hold the bottleneck, right? So, so those are operation risks that they always exist without you know a. Um, almost like industry-wide agreements that we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, et cetera, et cetera. That there's really no way to solve some of this. You just have to try to basically create uh, diversity in channels so that you're not exposed too much to various bottlenecks, if, if that makes sense. Now, on the counterparty risk, this is where it gets uh, kind of tricky. When you think about it, you know, if, if you park your money in, in, in a bank account, right, and I basically did the coins, then you think, well, you know, all these coins are moving around. Uh, where is the counterparty risk, right? I don't understand that. Uh, well, uh, as we learned this last month or so, because you have exposed yourself to the fundamental risk of the financial system, which is the inherent leverage of banking, you are at the mercy of that risk and you don't control it, right? The bank controls it. So perhaps the mistake of uh, USDC was for whatever reason, they decided that, you know, they're going to choose a designated bank to do all of this. If they would have spread this over 200 banks, maybe this would not have happened, right? Maybe this would not have been a big deal. If only 1% of those deposits were basically an SVB, eh, okay, yeah. There is a little blip, but I mean, that's about it. But when you've got a third of your deposits parked in one bank and the bank basically chooses to be a knucklehead with their risk management, all of that risk comes to you, whether you like it or you don't. So it's not necessarily a counterparty risk the way we think about you know, two parties against each other. It's almost like a third party risk that shows us ugly first as an indirect counterparty. And this is something perhaps that money market funds don't necessarily have in, in a way that happened to, to, to USDC. Uh, via SVB, you know, failure, but it is, you know, a lesson that we have learned that uh, you could outsource your uh, AML KYC costs to somewhere else, and you could have banks, it's just that you can't just have one designated bank, you really need to diversify that, perhaps even around the world, to even diversify against regulatory risk, right, I mean, if, if US wants to be hostile, and all your money is in a US bank, even if they don't fail, you're still exposed. So it makes sense to, to, to have a different strategy. And I think they've started to do some of that, but you know, this, this takes a long time to, to move things around and spread. Eddie, anyway, we have another question in the chat. All right. I think maybe it's too long or maybe, um, who do you want to, maybe we can unmute you and you can ask the question, you prefer to do it? Sure, I mean. Uh, uh, I will unmute in, maybe. Hi. Unmute. Hi. hi, hi, hi. Thanks for your answer. Uh, so I, I have uh, two further questions about uh, what you just talked about. So sure. for uh, 
so for fiat backed stable coins, the US dollar will be the uh, so called money, right? For it is used for clearing. And the, uh, for example, the US, USDC would be the credit for uh, use for refinancing. And uh, this, uh, and also for crypto backed ones, the Ethereum or Ether is as money and DAI as credit. So my question is in a crisis scenario, do you think traders will, will, will fly for liquidity or quality? in the well, case of uh of uh, stable coin and uh yeah so let, let me ask that question and then, and then we follow up so uh, yeah. i think if, if history is any indication people fly to liquidity first uh the yeah. more risk risk tolerant uh investors uh in the second order they fly for quality uh so the opportunistic investors or trader however you want to say it uh, they yeah. do take advantage of discounts that show up on quality side just because people are scared. Uh, but if you really are scared and you don't want to deal with any of this, which majority of the market that behaves that way, they go for liquidity. That's that's the first thing they go for. I see. So, but if, if the crisis is big, or let's say the uh, it, we are considering a long term scenario, what is your perspective on this? All right, so so that, that's uh, that's a good question and a very complicated questions, and, and, and it depends what you mean by crisis. Yeah. Uh, any crisis in banking, uh, if we have learned anything from almost a hundred uh, some years of uh, central banking and four hundred years of banking history, uh, can only be solved uh, by a lender of last resort to stepping up. Uh, there are no other solution. Um, so. You know, if, if for instance, if what happened in SVB is a harbinger of something more down the line to come, uh, the only person that can solve it is the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, I actually had a conversation with the banker yesterday. Uh, you know, when you think about it, major e majority of, of the unrealized uh, losses has to do with a mechanical relationship between the value of a fixed income security and interest rate. They raise interest rates, so your the value of market value of your fixed income drops down. However, that's irrelevant if you intend to hold it till, to maturity or if you have the ability to hold it to maturity. Majority of this stuff is beyond safe. I mean, you get paid your money back. Sure, it's an itty bitty little interest, but you're going to get it back. So if you're an extremely patient investor and you're not exposed to deposit runs or anything like that, you're just going to look at this and laugh because, you know, 20 years from now, I'm, I'm going to have all of my money. I don't have to tolerate any loss. Uh, the problem is that not all banks have that luxury, right? When, when there is a run to the deposits, they have to liquidate. And now they have to liquidate something at the 60, 70, 90% discount. Now we have a disaster. So who can solve this problem? But we have to bring the ultimate patient investor. That's the Fed. They can basically buy all the stuff, park it in their own balance sheet and not care at all. Uh, and, and that would dissipate the crisis altogether. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that it solves a fundamental problem. We have this problem because banks outright decided rates are always going to be zero so why bother with risk management it's expensive we're not going to do it so they didn't do it you know there are ways to solve this problem they just choose not to do it you could get involved in a swap in a swap in a compound option i mean there's the, the menu is just beyond imagination and in fact that's where finance is good that, that, that's the part that we actually know what to do you know elsewhere like you know forecasting where things are we suck at that this is what we're actually really good at and so they choose not to do what we're really good at and try to forecast what Fed does. I mean, who knows what the Fed is going to do? But that's exactly what they did. They tried to forecast behavior of someone else, and they thought they knew better than the other person how they're going to behave. Talk about arrogance. Um, so as far as banking crisis goes, the only solution is the big guy has to step in and sort of create backstop. If history is any indication in the last 20 years, every time there has been a major crisis, they have done they don't want to overdo it because you don't want to create too much moral hazard, right? You, you don't want to be, you don't want to say, well, we're going to solve this no matter what every time, because then, you know, there, this is going to just repeat it every year, right? We give you the cash, we bought the assets, it's safe, we can liquidate, et cetera, et cetera. But then you're going to take it and do another risky thing. So, so we, we don't want that. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated game that they have to play in order to make sure that, you know, it's within range of reasonability. Um, now, if you buy by crisis, you meant what's going to happen to the crypto ecosystems. Yeah. I really can't answer that. Uh, and I really can't answer that for one simple reason. 
the regulatory uncertainty, for that matter, I actually say that certain hostility in the U.S. is so high that you, without the biggest player in the financial markets being part of the game, it's almost impossible to envision what the trajectory looks like elsewhere. Right. Europeans try to be friendly, et cetera, et cetera, but they have their own problems. Uh, you know, Asia tries to be friendly. They've got their own problems. And at the end of the day, even to this day, U.S. is the biggest currency, biggest peg or base for all trades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So until that equation changes, um, crypto or however you want to say it, Stable coins, blockchains, whatever, whatever the right word is, they do need U.S. to be part of the equation. And as you can see, U.S. refuses to be so. I see. So can I can I have some time for one more question? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my further question is: so what you said is that uh, during crisis, basically we need money. We need the Federal Reserve to create cash and uh, to uh, and to uh, to supply the uh, quality assets. So, uh, in in the case of uh, stablecoin, uh, doesn't this uh, contradict the uh, the promise or the uh, the uh, the prospect of stability? As uh, stablecoins are promised to provide stability in crisis, and uh, it seems that in a crisis, the stability cannot be provided by stablecoins, which uh, which act well, as money instead of uh, sorry, which acts as uh, as credit instead of money. So, so do you think this, there's- No, no, that, that, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Uh, and the single most important reason is Federal Reserve does not recognize this thing as a money, not even a private money. So when they need to backstop, they don't backstop, right? They don't care. It can go all, the, uh, all of them can go down to zero. They couldn't care less. Since they have not admitted or accepted legitimacy of this as a version of currency for whatever you know place that it belongs to, then they're not trying to help it, right? They helped money market funds, they certainly did. And, and it took you know 40 years for them to actually admit that they matter, right? I mean, it's, it wasn't, a, you know, we created an okay, now we were all good. No, it took a long time before they actually admit that it matters. But it got, to, you know, in money market funds, for instance, it was a matter of evolution. You know, they became the money that greased the wheel of investment and investment became behemoth. So Fed realized, hey, we can't mess with this thing. <laughs> this is going to collapse the entire economy. I mean, if we mess with the, yeah, the banks might survive, but this is going to do to the economy what the banks will do in a different way. So unless this ecosystem gets big enough that it's a threat to the economy, the Fed is, gonna, is not going to do anything to it. Absolutely not. So you're right. Uh, no private entity, right? That, that's why you need a Fed. No private entity would ever have the power to bring true stability. I actually had this discussion yesterday. You know, there was a time in 1907, they went and they begged JP Morgan to step in and to stop a run and a crisis. And he did. And the crisis went away. But 20 years later, 22 years later, in 29, they went and he said, forget it. I'm not doing it. I did it once. And you guys didn't learn that lesson. So I'm, I'm out, right? Uh, so, so and, and that's the problem. That is exactly the problem that the Fed has to solve. If I save you, how do I know you're not going to repeat it or, or do something even crazier? I don't know, right? So th there's always this game of, do, do I really need to save or not? And, and they only save when they see there is an abyss for the entire economy. We need to step in and we're going to deal with it. But you know, at this point, we can't just ignore it. This stuff, they're not big enough to matter. So they forget that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, do you think? Uh, so, I think that there is also a kind of competition between. Uh, so, as money, there is gold. Uh, so, sorry, there is Bitcoin, and there is a uh, U.S. dollar here. And uh, uh, so, it seems that uh, uh, you, you mentioned the case of uh, uh, a century ago, which reminds me of uh, Alan Abbott Young. It's um, from from Federal Reserve. Uh, his view that. Uh, the Fed can provide ultimate stability to the uh, to the market. So, do you think the uh, between the competition of uh, so sorry in a competition between Bitcoin and U.S. dollar, which one would uh, let's say do you prefer, or which one do you think is superior in terms of stability? So, to, to me, Bitcoin is not a currency. Bitcoin is an asset. It's a speculative asset pegged on monetary base. And I don't need to prove this to you other than plotting the Bitcoin movements and the monetary base in U.S. And you, if you look at that, you can see that there is, a, there is a huge beta, but it has a beta against monetary base. 
So that basically shows that it's not a currency, right? It's, it's, it's just a risky asset. And the only risk that shows up is, uh, is the monetary base. Uh, when monetary base is large, you've got money, so you can leverage that money. And that with the leverage money, you can buy this asset. When there is not, you got to liquidate, you got to uh, pay attention to the margin calls, et cetera, et cetera. So if that's true, and that's my, my view, uh, then there is no competition. Uh, if you're pegged against something else, you have no competition. You're at its mercy, not competitive. That, that's, that's the point. Um, so in that perspective, then, you know, I think the, 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 the discussion is moot because if, if I take that view, then there's nothing to compete. However, yeah. uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a caveat here. And the caveat is this. If the true ethos of creating a digital money that can uh, undo the control of central banks over money, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. Now, whether that's Bitcoin, ETH, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Um, could that come true? Uh, I can't answer that. What I can tell you is this. Ever since the invention, as we know it, invention of um, reserve currencies, right? And that, that's a that's a... Uh, that's a title that we give currencies. It's not really, you know, an official sort of thing. Uh, you know, the first ones were basically the Medici's uh, and the Italian, you know, uh, two currencies um, almost you know, 400 years ago. Uh, with the exception of that, every single reserve currency has belonged to a superpower, a military superpower. And here's the reason. At the end of the day, a currency, especially a reserve currency, it's not a reflection of your economic power, your financial wherewithal, none of that. It's only a reflection of one thing. So I'm going to say something, and some of you are going to get offended, but that's okay because that's history. So when U.S. or the Europeans, I'm, I'm assuming you're Chinese, so you're familiar with what the European powers, four powers did to China and Shanghai you know, almost 100 years ago, or what they did to Japanese in Tokyo Harbor. When you need to open trades and you need to force people to come to table and trade with you and make commerce with you and they refuse, the only thing that's going to bring them to the table is not your money, is not your gold, is none of that. What is it? It's your military power. A reserve currency needs to project its military power. Bitcoin has none. At the end of the day, if I want something that when I'm at risk, I need a big bad bully standing right next to me, tell the other guy, buckle up. I can't trust a currency that doesn't have that power. I have to go to a currency that has that power. Now, who's the only candidate that has that in this world today? China. Now, if China chooses to make ECNI the base for their Belt and Road or everything else, fantastic, right? It's the long way to go, right? I mean, these things don't happen over time. They take, you know, almost centuries to, to basically happen. It's a long way to go. But the only candidate that exists that can become a serious competitor to U.S. dollar is ECNI. It's not Bitcoin. It's not ETH. It's none of that. It's another superpower projecting its power with its currency. And you, you don't, you, and you don't need to, to believe me, right? What you need to realize is that right now, as of now, right, they're making contracts with Russia, with India, et cetera, et cetera, to accept what you want as a base of the bilateral trade. I rest my case. I see. Thanks for, thank you for the answer. I sure. think uh, a lot of time. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Very no much. problem. All right. So, um, let me get to the algorithmic ones. So uh, what's the difference between algorithmic ones and, and, uh, and the fiat bank? Uh, you know, the stability in fiat bank should be mechanical, right? Dollar, coin, boom, you've got it. And algorithmic is not like that at all. Algorithmic has to incentivize flow of funds between whatever the crypt, whatever the, the stable coin is and whatever the backing is. Now, the backing can be complicated, can be singular. I mean, all kinds of stuff can happen. But they have to basically incentivize buy and sell on either side in order to basically bring the one that is depreciated higher and the one that is depreciated lower to maintain that sort of a, uh, stability. So Dow, for instance, that is trying to uh, pick against dollar, uh, they basically do this by providing essentially an interest rate when you deposit uh, uh, currencies to their system. 
Uh, so by changing the saving rate, they're incentivized buys and sells, basically. Uh, there are other mechanisms to, to incentivize this. You know, Frax does it a little bit differently. They've got mechanisms through which they basically um, create um, credits or they take credit away, but it's basically the same idea. You're basically trying to uh, pay through a mechanism some sort of an interest rate in order to make that uh, uh, part of the uh, peg you know, more attractive. So to give you an example, let me, um, let me go to the picture. Um, so if you think about it, you know, what, what you're basically doing with Dow, for instance, is that you're uh, depositing some sort of a collateral and they have over collateralization. So you really don't get one to one. When you put, you know, a dollar amount of your collateral, they allow you to only have a fraction of it in form of the cryptocurrency because they want the vault to be always safe. So, you know, if, if you've got something that you think there's tremendous volatility, instead of making it one to one, what you basically say was, I've got these bands of volatility uh, outside the bands of volatility is safe within, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to play with that. So I'm going I'm to stay in a safe zone, not, not a risky zone. Uh, but nonetheless, what you basically do, you create this uh, sort of a uh, link uh, between the collateral and the, and the currency. And if you feel like, you know, I, I need to bring something down or something up, then you play with, with their saving rates. So you know, for instance, you know, here's an example of how they manipulate in order to get the, uh, the translation rate uh, right. So, you know, if, if they vote to bring the uh, uh, saving rate uh, down, what's going to happen? Well, the demand for, uh, for DAI is going to go down. Well, if the demand was, goes down, the price is going to adjust. The price of the collateral, which is basically the fiat, is going to go up in, in comparison. So you can bring that stability. But what if, you know, it's lopsided the other way around? Okay, I mean, raise the saving rates, you know, then you have more demand of this, the price of it is gonna go up vis-a-vis -vis the, whatever the other side is, you know, the, the, the currency that they're bringing in to buy it. So the price of this goes up, the other one goes down, again, you bring the stability. So this is, you know, this is simple uh, process of managing uh, uh, basically price of same thing in different uh, places. The law of one price, right? What a, what a law of one price said that the price of the same thing within transaction bounds should be exactly the same no matter where you are uh, in various places. Um, now, if, the, if, if, if it fails, basically it's an opportunity for arbitrage. So these are as close as you can get to arbitrage, but not necessarily arbitrage, because arbitrage is self-enforced. These are not self-enforced. You have to incentivize their enforcement. And that's exactly my, my next point, that the failure or the failing of these systems is that it always have to incentivize. Whereas in fundamental uh, sort of a price of uh, uh, law of one price, you don't incentivize at all. Links exist, so break from the links creates incentives themselves. I don't have to do anything about it. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that uh, you know uh, gasoline is selling for six bucks a gallon in California, and it's three dollars here in, in Wyoming. Okay. Now let's say that uh, this is within reason because it takes $3 to pay the taxes, to pay the shipping, you name it, it costs that much to basically take it from Wyoming to California. But let's say for some fluke of nature, it just happens to be that I can get this not at $3, but if I buy in bulk, I can get it at $2 in Wyoming. Well, there's a dollar difference that you cannot explain with the transportation and all of that. All right, well, I'm gonna go basically uh, convince a guy that I'm gonna buy 10,000 gallons of gasoline from him if he agrees to sell $2. I'm gonna take that contract, go to a bank and say, look, and I, I'm gonna go to California to, uh, to another guy. So look, I've got 10,000 gallon. I can sell it to you just a hair below six, say five from 50, right? So there's 50 cents is still for me here. I take that, now this is a 50 cents guaranteed profit, right? I guaranteed myself 50% profit. We're not a still arbitrage, true arbitrage. The true arbitrage is this. Then I go to a bank and say, if you fund the purchase of this whole thing and the transfer, all the costs, right? If you fund all of it, I can pay you back with all of it plus an interest. Let's say of my 50 cents, 10 cents of it is his, uh, is his profit well, for just a, you know, two weeks transportation. That's a lot of profit for a bank. The bank agrees. Now what have I done? I basically created profit for free, risk-free. Now that's pure arbitrage. 
the moment this happens, what's going to happen? As I buy more from the guy in Wyoming, he's not a stupid, he's like, something is wrong. I can't sell this thing for two bucks anymore. So he's going to ratchet up his price. And I'm trying to unload this in California. The other guy is not a stupid either. So I'm buying all this crap. <laughs> Where am I going to put this? So he's going to br bring his price lower. At some point in time, we all reach to where the trans, uh, you know, the, the natural sort of a within transaction bound is. And I'm going to stop because there's no reason to do it anymore. So any system that has to have self-regulation, self-stability needs to rely on this force. This is not that force. This pretends to be, but it's not. Because you have to actually pay for buyers and sellers to show up. Whereas the other one, you don't. Buyers and sellers just show up by themselves. So what's the trick? To me, the algos are great because they basically are based on that ethos that we need something decentralized, right? We don't have these pesky you know, central banks inside the equation. We don't need this the trusted third party, you know, none of that nonsense, et cetera, et cetera. The only problem is they rely on half of the equation. They haven't solved the entire equation of how do we create self-regulatory stability, not you know, forced stability. To me, um, I think Terra example sort of tell us, if you have a leakage out of the system, right? If, if, the, if the system has to rely on someone else, you're lending and borrowing to someone else, you know, whatever have you. If the system is not self-sustained, it will break. That's a guarantee every time. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's here, your currency, no matter what. When you're at the mercy of someone else, they will break you, pure and simple. You don't believe me? You, you've heard the story of Soros and Druckenmiller. Just re you read the Harvard Business Review. You know how they bankrupt the Bank of England. Everybody's bankruptable when you're at the mercy of someone else. Right? So uh, what's the solution? To me, the solution is that there's a great opportunity that is missed. If you believe that algorithmic stable coins are basically synthetic cash, the moment you say that, the moment you believe that, then the solution represents it presents itself, right? Synthetic is derivative. Every risk-free asset, every cash is a cornerstone of every derivative, right? If you ever written a derivative asset, what is it? You basically create a replicating portfolio. This replicating portfolio should be equal to what? Risk-free asset, cash. That's what it should be. So without that risk-free asset, the derivative replication cannot exist. So the moment you create a derivative inside an ecosystem with all its existing assets, what you've done, you've closed the loop. That ecosystem itself is self-sustaining. It doesn't need anybody else. Arbitrage can exist within that framework. And because arbitrage can exist within that framework, then it can self-regulate itself. It doesn't need anybody to incentivize anything. Price can go out of act. It doesn't matter because now I have incentive to recreate the, recreate the derivative synthetically or buy the derivative outright or sell it, you know, whatever have you, whatever, whatever the strategy is, doesn't matter. The fact that now synthetic cash and derivatives and the assets are all exist in one place, it makes it a self-sustaining equilibrium. And in a self-sustaining equilibrium, now, is this a great idea? Well, let's look at the numbers. Everybody's crazy about this payment and stuff. You know, whatever I've heard, you know, last, you know, 10 years, five years, everybody wants to be the next big payment guy. How much is the payment? Well, the money market funds are even bigger than the payments, but the size of them globally is 8 trillion. Okay, I mean, you know, you're not going to replace it all, but let's say even if you did, that's an $8 trillion market. Nice big number. But let's look at other alternatives. The bond markets, the credit market, is 128 trillion. And what is the derivative? <laughs> More than a quadrillion. If you wanted a piece of action, which one of these do you want it to have? I, th I think I'd rather to have a piece of action the quadrillion. I don't, I don't want to be bothered with the eight trillion, with all the regulation and thousands of competitors. And I mean, why, why would I want to bother with that? Forget that. The real money is somewhere else. So I hope that you, know, you, you buy into what I'm selling here, but you know, maybe not, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I, I think that there, there, is a, uh, there is a very clear dichotomy that not all the stable coins are created equal. The fiat ones are just a different animal. They, 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 uh, uh, similarities with money market funds are just beyond uh, denial. And so lessons we learned 50 years, we should be easily applied instead of fighting it. Uh, the other ones, the algos, I think there is a tremendous amount of opportunity being lost trying to force behavior where 
the solution is just create a closed uh, ecosystem and not closed economy, but closed financial system that brings about arbitrage just by itself. The moment you do that, you don't have to worry about nothing. There would be volatility, sure, but they already have volatility, who cares? Since now they have volatility, they just bring about what you want, which is the synthetic cash behaves like a synthetic cash. All right, that's all I've got to say. So uh, I, I feel that uh, in, a, in the establishment of, uh, of the consensus as to what is money, there are more uh, factors that need to be considered, especially regarding the establishment instead of the maintenance of such a consensus. I feel that the, uh, the, the major, uh, let's say the major factor then will not be a uh, force. It could be some, something else. And I would appreciate your input on this. So you're, you're absolutely right. Look, um, uh, th this, this is not a new debate. This, this has been going on for some time. Um, I belong to more of a Keynesian camp, if you will. Uh, I think that money, uh, so, so I'm gonna give you my, my bit of history and, and I'll tell you why. So up until Waterloo battle, money was the providence of, of a king or queen. Uh, the, all the golds and the silvers of the empire basically came, belonged to the king and they came to the king. So we all bow down to the king in order to get a little bit of that so we can go do our stuff. And I don't need to prove it to you other than pointing to the fact that when the Spaniards got access to the gold of Incas, I'm not denying the atrocities. I'm, all I'm saying, just in a pure sort of a high level you know, picture. When the gold of the Incas showed up in Spain, there is a century of what they call century of inflation. Prices in Europe that has been depressed throughout the dark years, all of a sudden start going up at a click of about 4% per year. I mean, for a world that actually depreciated, 4% per year inflation is huge. I mean, it's beyond measure. Every single currency in Europe can trace, during that century, could trace itself, its provenance back to the gold that the Spaniards brought back in, right? So, so, so that model existed for, for a very long time. And on the eve of Waterloo Battle, something fundamental happened. What Brits didn't have, what all the Northern Europeans didn't have, was that they didn't have um, the, you know, the Incas. They didn't have uh, the French silver from Africa. They didn't have all the natural, you know, it's precious metals that the Southern Europeans were bringing from the colonies. So how do you then build the economy when you don't have the other currency? Well, the Dutch actually had the solution for this, just that they were too small to do anything about it. Yeah. The Dutch had um, credit. They created credit. They had the, the first uh, annuities in form of uh, sort of insurance, but they traded it. So they created this liability and then they traded the liability and they showed liability can become uh, uh, in money. What Brits basically did, they, they sort of uh, leveraged it, expanded, and they took it to a whole new level. When they issued their consul bonds, the forever bonds, imagine you're an itty bitty little island and Napoleon is raging war in entire Europe have basically defeated the Russians. I mean, so you're not talking about just anybody, right? I mean, the one that basically subdued all the great empires of, of Europe. And this man is about to put you out of business. <laughs> In that environment, they issued a forever bond. What does that mean? That may, to me, that means not only are we gonna deal with this little midget, we're gonna put him down and we're gonna be the empire who's gonna replace that empire. That's what that means. And who bought this stuff? They bought it. Sure, the people who had money bought a lot of it, but you know, they bought it. No foreigner bought that because no foreigner could ever believe them that this, they're gonna do this. They yeah. bought it. They created their own future for the first time and the only time in the history of mankind, a time machine was invented. The Brits made a promise with themselves that we're gonna do this, we're gonna create this, right? So because I'm creating this, it's like you're moving through time, looking at yourself 100 years from now, all powerful and wealthy, and tell yourself, dude, I need a buck today or you're never going to be. What are you going to do? You're going to give yourself the buck. You're going to create a credit debit with yourself that expands time, not person. This is not the regular accounting. This is accounting in time, right? You basically say, all right, I get a credit now and I will pay it in future. Like I said, for the first time, the time machine was invented. The moment that happens, the nature of money changed. Money went from being based on a, a, a currency that the king had to a currency that was based on a future that people created for themselves. The money became populous. It was people's money. 
not the king's money. The world changed, right? All those empires are gone. Um, the, the people who were involved in that process, the Rothschilds that actually helped the, the Brits to do this, because they took all those bonds and then they, 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 they gave gold to all the partisans in, in Europe that fought with Napoleon and his forces, et cetera, et cetera. So they actually made this happen. And the day, at the day of Waterloo, when tide basically turned, they did the exact opposite. They got rid of all the golds and started buying, buying, buying all these bonds like there was no tomorrow. And then they built a banking empire predicated on that notion. They became the largest sovereign bond underwriter in the world for the next one up until even now right so the, it changed the world the world from uh, went from the world of cash money so to speak or you know the gold money if, if you will to credit money so uh, th this is not a new thing you know every so often not that often but every so often we as a species have changed what money actually means right Maybe we are in, in, in another, you know, and we're looking at another future. Maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sold on that. Uh, but, you know, maybe that is true. Uh, now, the other thing, of course, is, you know, as, as uh, I guess Hayek uh, was one of the proponents of the private money. Yeah. Uh, but then again, you know, Hayek believes in private enterprise anyways. <laughs> I don't think that private money can be 100% private. There are private money, like I said, money market is private money, euro dollar was private money. There are, there, there are large examples of them. But the only, the, the only caveat is they're always within a very connected, closely connected network that self-regulated itself. So th there are, uh, uh, there is a history of if you're about to create a private money, what needs to happen? And none of the ones that try to be today fits any of those check marks. That's the problem. And you can't just recreate, you know, something, or you can't recreate wheel without actually understanding what wheel is. If you think about it, you know, wheel is the only efficient mean of transportation, but in of itself is one of the most unstable forms you can ask. The stable form are like in a square or better yet, triangular. Those are stable forms. For movement, they're crappy. You can't use it. So, so, so th th that's the irony. Sometimes the things that look unbelievably unstable for movement, they're actually the best means. A am I making sense here? I think you are, uh, you are referring to, uh, to, I think you are referring to credit. So by, by using the wheel example, am I understanding it correctly? Yes, yes, absolutely. 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 All of them. I think it's also odd for privacy because the, the idea is that if you want to have a full privacy, there is some cost. So like creating this system that no one knows nothing and you keep your privacy is will be a challenge. It's not going to look like that. Like so, so, so let's 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 talk about that because that, that that's my favorite topic. To this day, the most protective private money is the bill because it's a bearer note, right? Not the checks, not anything else. It's the bill, right? When the Brits invented it, that's what they wanted. They wanted something that when you walk into a bank, I don't care who you are. What I care is that piece of paper has provenance in of itself. So when you present it to me, I'll look at it and say, yep, that's good. As good as it gets. And I don't care who you are, how you get it. You know, I don't care about none of that. Our exchange it's going to happen with 100% anonymity. You're going to get your gold. You're going to go away. I'm going to get my piece of paper. That's it. All done, right? No other money has been able to ever replicate that because they always ask for something. You write a check. You have to tell your, who you are, where your address is. I mean, you reveal everything about yourself in a piece of paper, right? Even the digital ones today. Someone wants to crack it, they will crack it. I guarantee you that. They know exactly who you are, where you are. So even to this day, the best thing we have that protects us against anyone else is cash money. The devil is, if you want to move $10 million cash, it's going to be a nightmare to move it, right? So it's the movement that makes it very difficult. You have to make this, uh, this, uh, this trade-off. If I want to do big and fast, I just can't protect privacy that well. <laughs> At least not until now, right? Maybe, and maybe perhaps, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, when I tell my students is that, I think it's wrong to try to recreate from a scratch. 
sometimes lessons are very valuable. What if we could create a digital money that has all the features of that piece of paper, but it was just digital? It has the ability, because so, you know, wh wh why, would, why do we use checks? Because you can write any amount you want. I don't have to carry 10 million with me. I just write 10 million, done. One piece of paper. Right? So what if we could create something that, you know, it, it's almost like cash, the way cash is, but it has that flexibility with denomination. Now, how we do it, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a ticky. I can't, I can't tell you how that's going to happen, right? right? But, but if we could that, we could solve those two problems at once with digital technology. That's it. I mean, that's the ultimate. That, 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 that's it. You do that, you're, you're done. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, so um, I was... I was wondering, um, I found this point very interesting about your vision, how stable coins could become the backbone of the derivatives of financial engineering ecosystem. Uh, but I'm having some trouble imagining like what that would, what such a world would look like. So I was wondering if maybe you can uh, like give some, some details here or, or sketch out what that would look like. Sure. So, you know, think about um, difficulty that existed and then we solve it with mortgages, right? So mortgages are, um, you know, in of itself, you can basically write a mortgage as a contract that can exist on its own, et cetera, et cetera. Problem is that the moment that happens, the risk of the borrower resides with the guy who write that contract. So the bank has to live with that risk, right? So how do we get rid of it? Well, you know, we first try to sell us stuff. The problem is, eh, you know, you, you have to basically unload one very specific risk to someone else. So you got to find someone who's willing to live with that risk. And that's, that's a really hard thing to sell, right? Uh, but the solution was to basically create a derivative. What was the derivative? We said, all right, forget it. What we're going to do, we're going to take all of that mortgages, lump them all together. We're going to create a pool. Now that pool has a much more diversified nature of risk. All those idiosyncratic ones are going to get lost inside of that, that mix. And then I'm going to create a bond that only is funded by the flow that comes from the portfolio. Now, if you want to be really safe, you could make it multiple bonds, some that has high priority and they get paid first and then the next and the next and the next. This was the securitization revolution. It changed the entire industry. Mm -hmm. It made mortgage lending something else. Banks went from being bankers to basically fixed income traders. So imagine we could. So up until now, you can't use any of this stuff, stable coins, you know, Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera, to actually do real stuff, right? You can't buy, you can't get a mortgage, you know, like a digital mortgage or, or you know, something. You can't do that. I mean, the stuff that we can actually care for, buy a car, you know, pay for a school, you know, buy a house. I, mean, I can't do any of that stuff. So what's it, what's it good for? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a currency. But you know, if, if I don't have it, I, I can't do anything with it, right? So what if we could, I mean, it's a hypothetical, a pure hypothetical. But what if we could create an, an ecosystem within which you could basically borrow to buy cars? Mm -hmm. right? So those contracts now exist. Those are credit contracts. But these credit contracts are basically now funded or replicated by the underlying digital assets, whether it's Bitcoin or option on Bitcoin or futures on a Bitcoin, you know, the whole shebang of it. You know, that replication is not an easy thing. You got to sort of sit down, write the payoffs, figure out, you know, what they're made of and then create it. But you could recreate the derivatives on the other side of it. Now you have created an ecosystem that is as close as possible. So if the price of the mortgage goes down, what that means is all the other stuff, the primitives, which are the Bitcoin, Ether, et cetera, whatever it is, all plus all the derivatives that are related to it and to this instrument, they all have to move with each other. They just can't move with, you know, in, independent from each other because they're all linked to each other. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, you know, that, that's a hypothetical example. Now, doing it is, is not an easy thing. I, I get that, right? When people came up with securitization, it took almost 20 some odd years before securitization was a force of nature in industry. So even if you start this, you have to market the mortgages. You have to make sure that people actually buy into it. I mean, it has to be as good as any other choice they have. It, it can be, you know, fundamentally different, right? I, I, I should be able to, all I know about the mortgage market 
or you know, car loan market, it should be exactly the same way, very similar. So you have to market this stuff, build that end of it. On the back end of it, you have to basically create the derivatives. You got to find people who want to participate. So this is a lockstep, a slow movement. It's probably going to take a decade, maybe even more, to get to a place that the size is so big that now it can basically sustain itself. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think you have a new record. It's the longest uh, talk that we ever had. Like <laughs> people ask so many questions, so it's good. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad it was lively. Uh, I, I know some of it is controversial, and, and I know I'm not your run of the mill, you know, professor. I, I, I get that, uh, but uh, you know, I do fundamentally believe that uh, there is a there is a disjoint between lessons that we should know and what we want to do. Here's the thing about finance, and I tell my kids you know, all the time, uh, we, in, we do invention all the time. We just don't do tectonic shifts every day. If I solve a mortgage problem once, I gotta milk this thing for the next century because I gotta create a whole ecosystem around it, right? Because it has to become part of the system. That takes time to do, to, to, to get to a mass that it makes sense. I can mess with it every day. Right. So our innovations are fundamental innovations. You know, when the Brits created the console bonds, we created money out of credit. To this day, 200 some odd years after, we're still milking it. Why? You can't mess with it. Right. It's, it's not one of those things that you mess with it. So, and I think that's the disjoint. If you come from a tech side, you feel like, you know, everything changes every minute of every day. Not in our world. It doesn't. It can't. That's the problem. So you have to embrace tech but have a very banker mindset to it. So you have to be a stodgy and a slow and old fashioned while you're incorporating and embracing a fast moving, you know, tech. And it's hard, it's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. 